I want to live a life of happiness and fulfillment, but oftentimes it's hard to figure out how to do that when we get swept up in our fast-paced world, chasing happiness in all the wrong places, looking for bliss in this materialistic world rather than looking within. My life hasn't always been perfect, and I haven't had the best mental health. I've battled with depression, my lows have been really low, and I feel like I'm caught in this rat race at times, stuck in the matrix, a prison of the mind, attached to this world to a point where you suffer when things don't go your way. So sold on the idea of the character you've been playing, so trapped by the ego. Seeing others live a great life on Instagram and you know you shouldn't compare, but we all have goals and you just can't help but feel crap. You just sometimes feel stuck. You know it's just your thoughts playing tricks on you, an illusion of the mind, and you know you're your most pure in flow, in the moment, in the now, a state of effortless action, as the Taoists would call Wu Wei. It's a place you want to be more often than not, and life seems so good when in this flow but I haven't always been able to tap into it. I believe the only way for me to be in this productive, blissed out state is with a strict daily meditation routine. I want that more in my life. I wanna see how far I can get living a more present life. Hoping it's not just going to help with my creativity and a sense of purpose, but also my productivity and making progress with my goals. I've always been amazed with how happy monks always seem to be all the time. You often just see them laughing for no reason as though they understand the cosmic joke. Don't we all wanna get closer to the highest point of consciousness, nirvana, enlightenment, and awakening? Becoming the one like Neo in the Matrix. So guys, this is the story of me living like a monk for 10 days. Nothing can harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. Sometimes I wish I could just head off into the mountains and go live with monks, shave my head, sell my car, get rid of all of my possessions, and just... Go live with monks for the rest of my life. Part of my ego still holds on and I don't think that's a possible solution. So I was looking on the web for places that imitate or create some kind of setting which is monk-like and I came across Vipassana. Vipassana, which means to see things as they are, is one of India's most ancient techniques of meditation. It was rediscovered by Gautama Buddha more than two and a half thousand years ago and was taught by him as a universal remedy for universal ills. This non-sectarian technique aims for the total eradication of mental impurities and the resultant highest happiness of full liberation. Vipassana is a way of self-transformation through self-observation. It focuses on deep interconnection between mind and body, which can be experienced directly by disciplined attention to the physical sensations that form the life of the body and that continuously interconnect and condition the life of the mind. It is this observation-based self-exploratory journey to the common root of mind and body that dissolves mental impurities, resulting in a balanced mind full of love and compassion. So in Vipassana, it's a 10-day course that you go to. You can't just go straight to it. You have to sign up and wait on a waiting list. And once you get in, uh, you go. I went to Pomona in Queensland. And you, you hand your phone in, you hand it in your car keys so there's no temptation of escape. Me and some mates from the Vipassana that I know, we often make this joke that when are you going back to jail? When are you going to do another 10-day sentence and stuff like that? Because it's essentially a self-imposed jail. You can't talk, you have to hold a noble silence the entire time. You can't look at anyone in their eye. Whenever you walk past someone in the retreat, you look down and don't acknowledge their existence because you're there for you and no one else. You have to do some deep inner work and it's the perfect setting for it. You have to fast for 18 hours, meditate for more than 10 hours every day. The habit pattern of the mind. Wake up and realize this is all made up of thoughts, just thoughts. Your appreciation of beauty is a thought. Your aversion to an object that is ugly is a thought. Your craving or aversion is nothing but a passing thought in the mind. Realize this is just a thought and you will be free. So misery, it's a complex thing. But honestly, I believe that humans tend to make it more complex than it kind of really is. In this section, I'm going to break down how misery is essentially caused. There's two main reasons. And then through meditation and living like a monk, how we can actually cultivate stillness, peace, contentment, and just live with the misery and not let it impact us as much as it really needs to. So we can live a happy and fulfilled life. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> so I guess from spending 10 days meditating, over 100 hours of meditation, I began to realize that 
all of my problems were just man-made, mind-made problems that didn't have any merit in the real world. They're just all made up here. And we tell ourselves these stories of these things that have happened to us, whether good or bad. If they're good, we fall into the story and it builds us up and then we, we build our ego up of this idea of who we are. Something bad that happened. Why did this happen to me? Blah, blah, blah. It's a story we keep telling ourselves that isn't necessarily based in truth. So I guess I'm talking about the habit pattern of the mind, in which case something bad happens or something unwanted that happens. We then react negatively with unhappiness. We get irritated and have this sense of agitation. So there's this concept called Sankara, and this is the reason why we're all miserable. And through meditation, we're able to eradicate it. So what are sankharas? They're essentially either a craving or an aversion of something that's happened in your life. So you may generate a feeling of attraction or want for someone or something. And this is called creating a sankara of craving. Or if you heard some profanity directed towards you, which you didn't like, this is creating a sankara of aversion. The concept of sankara loosely means reaction, which explains many people's feelings of eternal misery. So the whole goal of meditation is to clear your old stock of sankara. When you're sitting there in that meditative pose and you're focused on those body sensations, Gautama Buddha said that these sankharas are coming to the surface. They're coming up from the depths of within us, these these deep-seated habits, they come to the surface and we essentially purify ourselves from them. And through this process, we're training our minds to be equanimous so that new sankharas aren't generated when we face any ups and downs in life. And then once all sankara have been cleared, one's mind then becomes clear and free from all suffering. What I'm trying to explain is essentially a self-constructed illusory prison of the mind. So it's all thoughts. Are you the thoughts or are you separate from those thoughts? That's the question I had to ask myself. And through meditation, I came to a point of disassociation from my thoughts and not identifying as the thought. It's hard not to think that we are the thoughts, but we are the thinkers of the thoughts. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's really hard not to identify with thoughts and especially negative thoughts. But through this experience, if you practice it enough, you really begin to disassociate with them and you begin to tap into the present and that breath and what's happening right now. There's no room for past or future thoughts. There's only room for what's happening right now in the breath and everything else just melts away and you're left with just pure bliss. So basically there's two types of thoughts. There's pleasant and unpleasant thoughts and they're all responsible for our misery. Pleasant thoughts, when you start thinking about something pleasant, either from the past or the future, a part of the mind has started to react. It's like, ah, wonderful, I really like this thought, this is an amazing thought, I wish this would happen again. Then this liking turns into craving, and then that craving turns into clinging. And then all of a sudden, you've lost the balance of your mind. And then that's when misery comes. You become miserable because you start craving. Then also when the mind starts rolling in the unpleasant thoughts of the past or the future, the mind responds with, I don't like this. I wish this didn't happen. Why did this happen to me? Then this not liking turns into aversion. And then it turns into a hatred. And then again, the balance of the mind is lost and you become agitated. It's either this craving or aversion that causes suffering and misery. And all of this is happening because one doesn't understand what's happening inside them and through meditation it becomes clearer and clearer on the experimental level how you're creating negativities in your mind the first few days of the course you do an anapana meditation technique which is a technique you sit that's one of, that's also one of the struggles i faced during the, the 10 days was the first few days it was so hard to sit in in a legs crossed position can you even hear me? I hope so. Jet, can you hold that for me? <laughs> in a legs cross position, and you're staying in this for hours at a time, hour intervals, so one whole hour, you sit like this and you keep as still as possible, you can't move, and you're focused on the bodily sensations. So first off, the first three days though, you focus on this area, like the triangle here, below your nose and above your upper lip, and you just sit and breathe, 
and just focus on any sensations you get, any itches, the tingling sensations. And the whole trick to Vipassana is sitting with your bodily sensations, but not reacting to them. You will notice them and you acknowledge them, but if you get an itch, you don't scratch the itch because that's being reactive. And that essentially is a lesson of wisdom for when something terrible happens in our lives, a negative situation that we don't really perceive or want to happen. It teaches us not to react so fearfully or so impulsively to those situations. It sort of gives us a, a sense of separation from those situations where we become less reactive and we can step back from them and realize that they're actually probably not that bad as we make them out to be. And we disassociate a connection of identity to those situations, if that makes sense. So yeah, essentially the Vipassana technique for the rest of the course is you're just sitting and you imagine imaginary line going down your body and you're just focusing on your body parts and any sensations that do pop up. The trick is to do this while you're indoors as well, because if you are meditating outside, more distractions, you're not meditating on things that are happening, the sounds in the outside world, you're focused on your internal and focusing on this body and mind connection. And you're just sitting with that and picking up any sensations. Oh, also I've got to mention yet two small vegetarian, mainly vegan meals for the entirety of the course. And you're fasting for 18 hours, like I said, and you're essentially just meditating, just meditating. You're essentially meditating from 4.30 in the morning till 9 p.m. at night with breaks in between. That is essentially what you're doing for the whole 10 days. 12 to one is rest and interviews with the teacher. And that was one of the amazing things. They had like two teachers there who were essentially gurus. You could go up to them and ask them questions about the practice or even life. And they just have this wisdom to come back to you with these answers that were just so perfect. It was one of the amazing things I loved about it. Gawanka, one of the main people responsible for bringing Vipassana to the West and all of his wisdom is shown to you like an hour each night in course form, in video form. And there was just some amazing stuff there that just helped tie in the lessons from that day into the course. But through all this meditation, I had these feelings of deep connection to everything and everyone. I had a sense of patience and almost like a tolerance for those who were, you know, quite annoying or push my buttons. They wouldn't affect me as much. I'd just forgive people a lot more, even for things that would be kind of outrageous. I just felt like I had this forgiveness in general. And one of the things that really helped with this was a specific meditation that we did learn during the course. And it's called loving kindness meditation and it helps to overcome all forms of negativity. It's a form of gratitude and unconditional love to everyone and, and everything. I often found myself just sending love to all the people that I did love, and even strangers, just every human being on this planet. And then that transformed from humans to animals and sending love to every single being on planet Earth. But this process brings about positive attitude changes by systematically developing the quality of loving acceptance. It's the qualities of acceptance and, and receptivity that creates the spaciousness and clarity of mind that allows for deepening attentiveness. Six years ago, I made the conscious choice to try and cause the least amount of suffering possible to all animals. If I love my dog, why should I eat a pig? An animal that has the same intelligence as a five-year-old child. What is the difference? Is there even a difference? If you really question it, it's just the way we've been taught from childhood. I couldn't imagine eating this little fella forest. Just a quick background story on this fella. He certainly hit the piggy jackpot, not once but twice. Unlike most pigs, Forrest was fortunate enough to have a good start to life by being part of a loving vegan family. <laughs> you love it, don't you, Forrest? Oh, Forrest. Unable to keep him and worried he might end up on someone's plate, they reached out to the sanctuary and he joined the sanctuary family here. Fresh hay, bedding, shelter, hills to roam, home cooked meals every night, lots of belly rubs and 
love in abundance, but most importantly, the freedom to be the individual that he is for the rest of his life. And to be honest, I think I've hit the piggy jackpot too. But yeah, if you want to sponsor Forrest or any other animals featured in this video, there'll be links down below, so check that out. Anyway, isn't that why we meditate? To reach this freedom, a freedom within, to escape the suffering of life, even for a moment, to feel the state of pure bliss and give us hope for what life can feel like when we are at our most divine. It's a mode of being, an attitude, a form of spiritual support. You're capable of finding it anywhere. If Viktor Frankl could find it in concentration camps, you can just about find it anywhere. Whoa. That was cool. Did you do that for the camera? <laughs> no. Okay. Don't chew that. You can't chew that. And since I've meditated for so long, I feel I can tap into this inner freedom sensation or state of being wherever I am in the world. Where if I start to worry about something in life, not happening the way I planned, I can just sit and meditate and it's almost like this reset button where I start over again and have this altered state of perspective. It's a certain control over your mind, controlling your mind rather than letting it control you. Allowing you to switch off any negative thoughts that come up and not get lost in the story that they tell you. Boy.